Hi, and welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sophia Lovegrove, um, and I'm an independent curator and researcher based in the Netherlands. And I'm really excited to introduce our four, uh, fourth virtual gathering. Lives of Objects Virtual Gatherings is a project of the Goethe Institute, led by the Goethe Institute London. And I'm very happy to have been able to develop uh, the curatorial concept for this series and have had the opportunity to meet so many incredible individuals in this process. Uh, we created the series as a platform for discussion amongst researchers, artists, and cultural workers from the African continent and beyond to explore the implications and different meanings of restitution work. By restitution work, we refer to the complex process of recovering or returning ancestral belongings that were taken to Europe during colonial times, or in other cases, uh, in particularly settler colonial contexts, also within countries themselves, um, often under very violent circumstances. We view restitution as part of a larger process of reparations for historical violence in its, after in its afterlives in the present. And we acknowledge that the loss of ancestral belongings, cultural heritage and knowledge is but one of the effects of the long and violent history of colonialism. We acknowledge that violence, while being hopeful that restitution work when practiced with care, can contribute to creating more equitable relations and futures. And with this series, we bring together really important and inspiring African, African European initiatives and projects, and also from outside Africa, as is the case of our event today, while challenging the growing Eurocentric discourse on this topic. Each gathering focuses on one topic, but they have all, and I'm sure today as well, will continue to be very, very uh, deeply entangled. I am uh, very sad to, to share with you that this is our fourth and final gathering. It has been an incredible journey of sharing and learning together, an incredible honor also to have been part of this journey. And I really hope this series will have uh, a lasting effect and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what comes out of it in the coming time. But first, let's move on to our event today. Um, I will now pass the, the virtual mic to Sherry Davis, who is the moderator uh, for today and has been for our last events as well. Sherry is an award-winning musician, filmmaker, and curator with a passion for utilizing the arts to inspire social justice. She has recently been working on a very inspiring arts project called Ode to the Ancestors, which commemorates the Black contribution to conservation and archaeology in East Africa, an exhibition of photographic archives that celebrates Kenyan heritage professionals from in and around the colonial period, was recently on display at the Horniman Museum in the UK, and will be touring Kenya uh, with the National Museums of Kenya uh, soon. So if you have a chance, I highly recommend to visit. Uh, Sherry, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sophia. This event will include a moderating discussion with the speakers, but we'll make room for input and questions for, from everyone who's joined us today. So today's conversation focuses on the concept of rematriation and on the role of women and indigenous knowledge in relation to the topic of restitution. How does the restitution of cultural heritage and ancestral belongings connect to other forms of redress and repair, such as the reclamation of ancestral land and indigenous knowledge? This event will be slightly different from our previous events. We will start with Robin Gray, who will give a short presentation about the concept of rematriation, which stems from the work and thinking of indigenous women in North America. We will then be joined by Nana Ofriata Ayim, Mwamba Chikwemba and Samba Yonga, whose work in different African contexts also focuses on indigenous knowledge and the role of women in society. I'll now introduce the speakers as they join our conversation. Mwamba Chikwemba is a self-taught multimedia visual artist based in Zambia, whose painting practice features closely cropped portraits of women. The subject matter of her work, usually young women, emphasizes pride and confidence. Nana Ofriata Ayim is a writer, filmmaker, and art historian who lives and works in Accra, Ghana. She is the founder of the Anno Institute of Arts and Knowledge. She is currently a special advisor to the Ghanaian Minister of Tourism, Arts and Culture on Museums and Cultural Heritage. Robin Gray is Sum Zian from Lak Walams, British Columbia, and Ms. Cree from Fort Chippewan, Alberta, Canada. She is Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Toronto, Mrs. Saga, 
and was recently appointed Special Advisor on Rematriation to the Vice President and Principal at this university. Samba Yonga is an award-winning journalist, communications specialist, and cultural curator based in Lusaka, Zambia. She is the founder of the Women's History Museum of Zambia, established in 2017. I'm very excited to go on to a presentation by Robin Gray about this new concept to me, at least, this concept of rematriation. Robin, could you tell us more? Thank you for the introduction, Sherry, and uh, uh, for the invitation to join you all in the conversation today. So I'm here to discuss uh, the rematriation concept, which I think of as the antithesis to repatriation. When I began to consider the efficacy of the term rematriation versus repatriation, I began by researching the term's usage in the archive, online, and on the ground. One thing is clear from this research, that the term originates in Indigenous women-led discourse and activism, which can be traced back at least a few decades. So for instance, uh, my auntie, Lee Miracle, the late uh, Stolo author, orator, and educator, used the language of rematriation in her oratories and publications starting in the 1980s, but didn't necessarily define or explicate the term, even though one can infer from her body of work that she would have identified it as an indigenous feminist concept with decolonial aims. At the time, she argued for the rematriation of indigenous governance vis-a-vis -vis the restoration of women's political roles among and between indigenous nations. So those who mobilize the term rematriation today often attribute uh, Lee Miracle's book, I Am Woman, as an originating source of inspiration for and understanding of rematriation discourse and activism. Now, looking to the front lines and cyberspace, I also found that the growth of women-led rematriation collectives on the ground correlates to the growth of women-led rematriation discourse and activism online. In tracing an emerging genealogy of thought and action led by Indigenous women in the archive online and on the ground, I have also witnessed multivocality in the usage of the term. This multivocality does not indicate uh, dissonance, but rather consonance. For instance, an analysis of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram indicates that rematriation is mobilized by Indigenous peoples in two primary ways. First, to foreground Indigenous feminisms, and second, to signify a range of interconnected needs, priorities, values, and actions. Proponents of the term express strong sociopolitical commitments that range from women's and LGBTQ2 plus rights, return of lands and safeguarding of waterways, to the recovery of cultural objects and ancestral remains, reclaiming indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, or even restoring something like female seeds in indigenous territories. So there's an incredible amount of multivocality, but that multivocality is in harmony with one another. Um, so in looking at all the ways in which rematriation discourse and activism has been mobilized by indigenous peoples, I come to the following preliminary working definition, um, that rematriation is an indigenous feminist paradigm, an embodied praxis of recovery and, and return, and a sociopolitical mode of resurgence and ref refusal. It is a work in progress definition, uh, which I'm working on in my first book at the moment, but identifying it as an indigenous feminist paradigm was a way for me to flag the indigenous feminist pulse that engendered rematriation and to recognize the leadership and labor of indigenous women in rematriation discourse and activism. So I'm not trying to debate and argue around feminism and feminist paradigms, but rather trying to indicate where the discourse emanates from and show that the people mobilizing rematriation are all foregrounding it as an indigenous feminist act. The refusal and resurgence part of the definition is, t is key to understanding what rematriation does or what I think of as the active qualities of rematriation. I see rematriation as an act of refusal, meaning that we refuse to play the games of the settler state. We refuse to succumb to all the paternalistic policies that define us, that control and govern every aspect of our lives. We refuse to be made into Indians or First Nations, but rather assert our unique indigeneity. This means that I'm from Tsipchan and Cree nations. I'm not just an indigenous woman from Canada as defined under the Indian Act. In critical indigenous studies, refusal is a generative concept that has been theorized in abundance as of late by some leading scholars in the field. And they show that refusal is a necessary act in decolonial processes so that we don't mimic the settler state or mimic Euro-Western ideas about something like personhood, nationhood, property, or ownership, for example. 
So in consideration of the interventions that Indigenous feminists aim to make um, and the grounded place-based and critical modes of recovery and return that Indigenous peoples take up, rematriation must also be seen as a vital socio-political process that centers and uplifts Indigenous nationhood. Rematriation involves both a turn away from the colonial order of things and a turn toward Indigenous nationhood. It moves Indigenous peoples further away from the distractions and constraints of state-sanctioned recognition politics towards the resurgence, not only of our own socio-political systems, but also a politics of refusal in our dealings with settler states, subjects, and institutions. Rematriation not only signifies what we are refusing, such as dispossession, colonialism, heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, anthropocentrism, and lateral violence, but also in the words of Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson, how we are, quote, producing and maintaining alternative structures of thought, politics, and traditions away from and in critical relationship to states, unquote. So all of the reparative work that Indigenous women in particular do to heal and uplift our families, communities, and nations actually contributes to the resurgence of Indigenous nationhood because they are leading with Indigenous laws, ethics, and protocols. In short, rematriation is an Indigenous woman and two-spirit-led embodied praxis of recovery and return that helps to restore the intimate relationship between Indigenous lands, bodies, and heritage. It is a vital decolonial process of return that engenders both a turn away, which is the refusal part, and a turn toward, which is the resurgence part. So that is why I come to this conclusion that rematriation is much more than decolonial wordplay on the commonly used term repatriation. It is actually an indigenous feminist rallying cry for decolonial futurisms. Um, and it is uh, a way to honor and celebrate the leadership and labor of indigenous women for relentlessly remembering, reclaiming and revitalizing indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing. And in my own work, I show that it is an especially pertinent concept to account for culturally specific modes of return in matrilineal and matriarchal societies. Uh, in terms of praxis, rematriation is a critical decolonial turn in the heritage return landscape as well. Um, from studying repatriation cases and learning about the experiences of so many uh, different communities and nations, I noticed that there is still an incredible amount of obstacles, burden, and paternalism that Indigenous peoples face in their quest for the return of their ancestors and belongings that were unlawfully and unethically taken during times of duress. The onus seems to fall on us to remember history, exert emotional, physical, spiritual, and intellectual labor, raise funds, investigate apprehension, trace circulation, make the claim, make the case, negotiate with gatekeepers, and often accommodate expectations for return. These tensions persist alongside advancements in human rights and social justice, because repatriation continues to be structured using Euro-Western laws, which are the same laws that were used as justification to violently dispossess us of our lands, ancestors, belongings, and knowledges in the first place. As a result, the imposed path of return under a repatriation paradigm is often paved with paternalism and possessiveness. To achieve justice for historical injustice, we need new paradigms for reparation, restitution, and return. For Simpsian and many other Indigenous nations, rematriation is the desired pathway for return because it is paved with possibility for improved nation-to-nation -nation relationships, it is governed by Indigenous laws, ethics, and protocols, and it results in better outcomes for Indigenous peoples. That is why rematriation is more than a simple wordplay. As my Auntie Lee Miracle argued in her book, Memory Serves, rematriation is, quote, the alternative to Western legal invasion, unquote. Um, so if we unpack the word repatriation itself, the very concept that rematriation is refusing, we can see that words and ideas have epistemological, ontological, and axiological anchorings, and thus material consequences. Repatriation is a Euro-Western concept derived from the Latin root word patra, referring to the father or the patriline. Repatriation is defined as the return of someone or something from a foreign territory to their origin, uh, country of origin, or the so-called fatherland. Uh, repatriation is a legal concept used by states to extend their territorial sovereignty beyond their borders and to make claims of ownership. Uh, what or who gets repatriated and why ranges from living in dead persons to properties and profits. Um, whatever it is and whoever it is, they must return to the fatherland and can thus be considered patriarchal possessions. So given its Latin roots and modern socioeconomic and political applications, one can see how repatriation assumes that the nation is patriarchal 
or in the words of Audra Simpson, again, that the state is a man. Uh, gender is not the only consideration here. If the state is a man, he is also white and very possessive, uh, what Eileen, uh, Aileen Morton Robinson defines as the possessive logics that underpin patriarchal white sovereignty. Analyzing how race marks the law's possessiveness, Morton Robinson argues that patriarchal white sovereignty, quote, as a regime of power, operates ideologically, materially, and discursively to reproduce and maintain its investment in the nation as a white possession, unquote. One way in which the state operationalizes patriarchal white sovereignty is through the repatriation concept, which extends settler ideology, materiality, and discourse. That's why I characterize, re characterize repatriation as a legal concept rife with colonial baggage that de develops from Euro Western ideas about nation and personhood, property, and ownership. Um, and just as a counter, um, you know, in a matrilineal society like the Tsimtsian nation, my nation, where rights flow through women, where we're into our own form of nationhood rather than settler statehood, uh, where our governance is structured around matrilineal descent and inheritance, where women assume critical leadership roles as big M matriarchs within our sovereignty structure, and where we have relational concepts of property and dynamic systems of property ownership, rematriation makes much more sense to us as a theoretical concept and as an embodied praxis. This is partly because we don't think about ownership in the possessive individualistic sense. In our society, ownership is multifaceted, dynamic and relational. There can be multiple levels of individual and collective ownership in a single heritage entity, like a song, for example. But the point is that it's about relationality. It's about how a song, a name, a crest design, a totem pole or mask, for example, connects us to one another across time and space and communicates where we stand within the Tsimtsian sovereignty structure. It's also about how the terms of use keep us accountable to each other. So these forms of property in our society aren't just things that can be commoditized and reproduced at large scales to maximize profit. We have things like songs and names, which are forms of property in our society, but they again situate us within our sovereignty structure, indicate what our responsibilities are, and connect us to people and place across time and space. So uh, we offer, uh, at least for my nation, uh, this concept of rematriation um, to think about uh, new pathways for return and the possibilities for the resurgence um, of Indigenous nationhood, however indigeneity is defined worldwide, not only here in North America, but also in the African continent. Um, so uh, I'll leave you with that and welcome any follow-up questions uh, related to my research or uh, needing any clarification on what I'm saying. I just wanted to summarize it in, in conversation form, um, but I look forward to hearing about the important work that all of you are doing on the ground. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Robin. That's fascinating to learn. How did you get engaged with rematriation, you pronounced? Yes. Or rematriation? Rematriation work. Yeah, well, it started as um, when I was a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. It was in 2010 that, um, you know, I returned home to Vancouver. I'm a, I'm a member of a Tsimtsian uh, dance group. Uh, in we dance and sing songs in our language and represent our Simpsianists to the world. Um, the leader of my group, who's a woman, you know, asked me to keep an eye out for our songs while I was out there doing our studies because she just knew that they were out there, you know, that we had experienced all these forms of dispossession from um, especially anthropologists and other types of ethnographers recording our histories and knowledges and taking them to archives and far off places and never knowing where they are. Um, and then I sort of serendipitously uh, stumbled across, upon this collection of uh, 42 recorded uh, songs and oral histories from my territory. Um, this woman named Laura Bolton recorded two Simpsian elders in 1942. And um, those songs were sold to Columbia University in New York City as part of a larger collection. And so that sort of made me say, okay, well, uh, she wants me to look out for our songs. Um, what should we do about this? Um, and it was through consultation with elders and community members and people from my nation who said, this is really important. Um, you need to bring those songs back home and figure out where they belong within our sovereignty structure. So like who owns the songs? Um, and that was one of the main questions that they asked immediately is, 
who owns the songs? I say, well, Columbia University says they own the songs. They, they scoff at that notion because, you know, how can someone own aspects of our heritage? We don't even know them. They're not related to us. They've never been um, accountable or um, responsible uh, to us. Um, and so that kickstarted a whole um, multi-sided community-based um, sort of auto-ethnographic research project um, to see, to breathe life into the songs and to figure out where they belong. So, so transforming static heritage, in, heritage into active heritage by reuniting the songs with the people in the appropriate place, so in our territory. So that's what I mean about restoring the intimate relationship between Indigenous lands, bodies, and heritage. Um, and yeah, so I've been leading this case study on song return uh, over the last 13 years now. And um, yeah, we engage important questions about ownership, access, and control. And we think about these things from the vantage of Simpsian law or Ayauksum Simpsian um, to say that in fact, these institutions who control access to our songs are actually in breach of Tsimtian law. Um, so we don't take the approach of um, recognizing their ownership. Uh, we actually say that's the original fault uh, and there are ways to rectify that, uh, to provide some form of restitution, but it, it needs to be on our own terms so that we don't produce the same um, paternalistic outcomes in our process of return. Of course. And you also uh, work as a special advisor on rematriation. Could you tell us a bit more about that and what that entails? Sure. Um, so I'm here in the Toronto, greater Toronto area, um, and I work for the University of Toronto downtown, but also the Mississauga campus. And um, Mississaugas are a local Indigenous nation, a part of the larger Anishinaabe group. Um, and that's where we get our namesake from. Uh, we found in a, a news article online about an old ancestral Indigenous village in the city of Mississauga that had been excavated. And uh, we read in that news piece that uh, 40,000 plus artifacts from that excavation were actually housed at my campus at the University of Toronto Mississauga in the anthropology department. And so um, as a member of the uh, Indigenous table, who is a direct line to the president, um, the sorry, the vice president and principal, um, we brought up this conversation and said, oh, well, we didn't realize there was such an incredible amount of Indigenous artifacts in the anthropology department. I wonder if the, the source community knows whether they're there or not. Um, and so that prompted the principal to appoint me as a special advisor on rematriation to help the institution figure out uh, the rightful owners and to um, enact a process of return that centers Indigenous laws, ethics, and protocols and actually um, results in a, a ethical and just um, form of restitution. So I have been liaising with local Indigenous nations. Um, the, the site itself and the artifacts itself are attributed to uh, Wendat peoples. Um, the Wendat were here in this area thousands of years ago, but had been pushed out and they're now in um, the province of Quebec. And um, so we are working on um, figuring out a process based on Wendat laws, ethics and protocols to ensure the rightful care um, and return of this vast collection <laughs> of uh, belongings um, back to their territory um, and with their people so that they can determine um, who can access things, uh, these things, who can study them and, and what should be done um, in terms of their care. That's amazing. And it's so great to hear about the work that you're doing in this area. And you're also writing a book on rematriation. Could you tell us a little bit more about it, please? Uh, yes. Um, so it's really um, building off of uh, my rematriation case study around the songs and also including some important cases of return amongst and between Indigenous nations on the northwest coast of what is now Canada. So in my region where the Tsimtsian peoples are. So there's a really incredible cases of return um, like the Haida Nation giving a song back to my people from Lahulams um, in the last 15 years. Um, and then in the 90s, uh, the Clinket people giving um, Chilkat knowledge back to the Simshan people um, in a uh, public uh, feast or potlatch. And 
I think I'm like, well, these are incredible uh, in examples of processes of return where there's not all these paternalistic situations that where there's no prior harm and, um, you know, sort of tension between ways of knowing, being and doing. And so that's where I see the generative possibilities um, around rematriation. And I use those cases um, as well as many cases where women are leading uh, the way to reclaim, to revitalize, um, to heal um, our nations, to remind our people what our laws are, what our responsibilities are. You know, I'm using all of these cases um, to talk about why re repatriation is problematic um, and why uh, the next critical turn in the heritage landscape um, of return should be centered on Indigenous laws, ethics, and protocols. Um, and that there are plenty of cases to showcase why um, this is important, especially if we're going to use terms like decolonization um, and social justice um, and to avoid treating these things like metaphor. I'm arguing for institutions and others to, you know, actually imagine otherwise <laughs> and to um, enact uh, policies and practices um, that emanate from our legal traditions uh, where it concerns our cultural heritage. So I would say that that's the argument for every um, situation, whether it's bodies, objects, or knowledge, um, and for whichever Indigenous people um, is implicated in the situation. Thank you so much, Robin, for sharing about your work. Yeah, it's amazing to learn. Let's go on to Mwamba. Mwamba Chikwemba will now tell us about the artworks she created during her residency within the project Fabricated Stories of the Women's History Museum in Zambia. Mwamba, can you tell us more about this project and your participation in it? Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, Hello. Thank you very much for the chance to talk about my work uh, during this gathering. My name is Mwamba Chikwemba. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I work uh, across mediums. I work uh, with paintings, uh, sculptures, installation. I'm born and based in Lusaka, Zambia. And most of my, my new body of work that I'm currently working on are focusing on women, uh, the position in their society. And uh, just in general, what is my position as a woman in this society? Uh, this came in the results when I was getting married and I realized that most of the roles that uh, happen during the ritual marriages in my Bemba tribe were mainly focused on women. So it gives me a, a lot of questions and uh, just those questions to ask myself, what is my role in this society? Uh, apart from that, uh, I'll be working with you through these works that I created through the fabricated stories, which was the residence, uh, online residence by the uh, women's history museums in Zambia. It was a, a eight weeks residence with um, about seven, eight uh, in different media artists. I was participating as a visual artist and we were given a platform to connect with, with artifacts which are uh, currently in the Sweden Museum um, just to connect and recreate our bodies of work inspired by the artifacts which are based in the museum. And to my surprise, during the residence, I got uh, I got a chance to see these Imbusa objects. Uh, the Imbusa objects are the um, objects which are used, uh, like aids which are used to, 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 which are introduced to brides when they are getting married. And uh, at that time, when I was doing the residence with the uh, Women's History Museum, that was the time I was passing through the same rituals of marriage. And I was I just recently got married. So I got interested and I got uh, to, I got the chance to connect with these objects and create bodies of works inspired by these uh, artifacts which are in the Sweden Museum. So, um, these are one of the paintings that I did before, because before the 
residence, I, I was creating body of work based on my experience as a woman in the process of marriage, what I learned through the process of marriage, just navigating the information and uh, integrating the information that I got through the teachings that I got before getting married. So these are, these are works that I created before my residence. So you can, crawl, you can scroll on to the other works. So these are some of the paintings that I recreated uh, through uh, in the time of the fabricated uh, stories residence. These are some of the objects that I got connected with and I created about, I created an installation and some paintings. Um, the paintings that I created, they were inspired by the objects because during my process of learning these, uh, uh, teachings, I never had an encounter to learn about these things. So my first encounter was when I was in the residence. So these were something new to me, but they are, they are something which uh, people use or Bemba tribe, Bemba speaking people use when someone is getting married. Unfortunately, in my process of marriage, I never had the chance to learn through these objects. Uh, yeah. And um, this is an installation that I created during the same residence, uh, talking about just to create conversation based on the uh, stories of women's side, uh, because uh, so the white plates is mainly used in Zambia when someone is being introduced or they're about to do the marriage rituals of marriage, like the first step that they do, it is called insalamu they use these plates. So I felt because these plates are mainly used in these traditional rituals, I should use them and just to uh, uh, attract people and just to bring people together and create a lot of conversation based on it. So the initial idea of this installation was to interview as many as women, Bemba women to be specific or women who are who have been married to a Bemba man, uh, just uh, create conversation and ask them about their experience, what they think, their general view about the teachings and uh, how, we, how it was. So this was a, a, an idea of interviewing uh, women from older women and the younger generation women, just to get the different view of how it is done and how their experience was. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. If you have any questions for me, you can ask me, then I can answer. Thank you so much for sharing your artwork. It's very beautiful. It's really striking. And I love how you're centering women in your work around um, just exploring your own heritage. So if I can ask you a few questions, uh, what sure, is the meaning sure. of the Imbusa teachings? and Imbusa objects? So Imbusa teachings is a setup of uh, the bride getting information from the older women who have gotten married before. It's like passing on information of uh, what you expected to do as a woman when you get married. So these, those are teachings. And the Imbusa uh, objects, these are objects that they use. It's sort of uh, an aid like, to show you, to show you this is uh, this, this, and it means this, and you should use it for this. It's like an, an instruction or some, it's an aid that is being uh, taught to you just to get the visual things of doing it in the marriage. Yeah. Um, and when you started this project, did you know that these objects were in the Museum of Ethnography in Sweden? And why did you choose to focus on these particular objects? So when when I when I was uh, when I was um, when I started with the women's museum, I started on a different note of uh, marriage ceremonies and what my experience was as a woman, as a Bemba woman. And when I got uh, this chance to work with with the women's museum and the uh, to connect with the artifacts. At first, I didn't have the idea that there's uh, such artifacts as 
and their lot, which are based in the Sweden Museum. So this was my first encounter and my first uh, information that there's these objects which are based in the museum. And having that knowledge that these artifacts are not supposed to be in public because it's supposed to be a sacred thing as a Bemba woman. It's only taught to a bride when before they get married or in the process of getting married. And getting to know that these artifacts are in the museum, it, get, it gives me a lot of questions and to do and the research on them and just to create a body of work based on it. Yes. And what did this project and engagement with the Mbusa projects mean to you personally? And also, what did it mean to you as an artist? So personally, it meant a lot because, like I said, during the time I was doing the residence, which was in 2021, uh, that, that was the time I was, I just recently got married. And... Uh, just me researching more on these objects. I remember the time for my researching and do, the time I was doing the same um, body of work calling Madame Agnes Yombe. Madame Agnes Yombe is one of the uh, senior artists who is working also mainly on that uh, topic. So I got scared because it's something which someone order who's working around it and I felt okay maybe I should ask information from from her and also it's like that information is supposed to pass is supposed to be given to me by the by the uh uh so we call them it's an older woman who's teaching you or educating you in the same process so yeah Thank you so much for that, Mamba. Much appreciated. So the project Fabricated Stories was developed by the Women's History Museum in Zambia. We're going on to mm -hmm. Samba now. Samba, could you tell us about the idea behind this project? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for joining us. Sorry, I had a... This always happens, like, you know, all of a sudden everything's great, then the power just went out. Luckily, it's back. If it does mm -hmm. go out during um, the conversation, I'll just switch to my phone, so please bear with me. Um, it's really interesting to hear in conversation, Mwamba. Thank you so much for taking us again down that road. Um, your work was one of the most compelling work, I think, during that residency because it introduced new ideas and new knowledge that we had been grappling with and how to give it a language, how to identify it and define it. And listening to you as well, uh, Robin, it's just so, so interesting to hear a language being given to a voice you're trying to express, but you don't really know how to say it. And once a language is attached to it, it all becomes clear. <laughs> and um, it's great to see all the parallels um, across uh, each of the work and projects that we're all doing. Um, to give a bit of background, the Women's History Museum was set up precisely for this reason, to understand the dualities that we experience personally, uh, myself and my co-founder, who is a cultural expert, with experience in the cultural and heritage sector for the last 30 years. But we noticed that in political governments and the canon of knowledge that we inherited from uh, the colonial past erased women deliberately. But in our own lives, women held such a strong um, position, whether it's politically, socially, and in terms of producing knowledge. And we wondered where those narratives were. And we started uh, investigating the idea of restoring and, and mainstreaming these knowledge systems as a way of validating and legitimizing a knowledge system that was interrupted by um, colonial experience, because this is something that has never been actually acknowledged. Um, us starting conversations around it in our own country, and I, and I know across many other African countries, is the first time the political governance is even recognizing there is there was such a thing as an erasure of women's indigenous knowledge or the production of knowledge. And it's, it's almost like um, living a duality or that doesn't connect. And on, on the one hand, we have this cultural heritage and way of life that we live, but we don't connect it to this modern 
way of life that was, or social structure that was introduced to us. Um, so we started uh, interrogating the aspects of knowledge production and what it means to have indigenous uh, knowledge and cultural heritage stand side by side with this idea and social contracts of modern knowledge and how knowledge is produced. And of course, as a result of that, we encountered these institutions of knowledge from the West that created these structures of knowledge and imposed on us through colonialism, uh, which resulted in an in interruption of our own knowledge. Um, some of the ideas and ideologies that now in the current uh, canon of knowledge in Africa, at least, is that I'll give some examples for, for example, that women are sidelined or women have no political agency in the communities or women have no uh, political agency in governance. Um, ideas that we didn't have knowledge or institutions that passed on and transmitted knowledge or that we didn't have a written language or we didn't have a way of decoding and encoding our own way of communicating to each other. And we started interrogating this because the more we encountered objects, particularly uh, objects that had been taken away from these communities that actually acted as the institutions where knowledge was produced, we started realizing that this disruption took away the opportunity and ability of these communities, knowledge keepers and indigenous knowledge uh, holders, the, the opportunity to continue producing this knowledge. And we started now connecting with some of these institutions in the West that had taken uh, objects and started interrogating how they themselves are producing knowledge with these objects because in a sense, a lot of those objects when they were taken during anthropological studies, during the colonial uh, adventures, they were taken as artifacts of aesthetic. But these are artifacts that actually held knowledge, that held a language, that when decoded and when transmitted, they provided meaning uh, to the communities. So the fabricated stories uh, residency was an attempt to kind of uh, investigate how we could recreate a space, a pathway, uh, I think Robin, you called it a pathway to reintroduce this knowledge and um, validate it within the communities. A lot of young people such as um, Mwamba have grown up in a cultural society where a lot of that knowledge is absent. Um, largely because the communities are so far separated from them and no longer practice them. And another part of it is that the colonial experience still has a huge dominant control in how we produce knowledge and that indigenous culture is not a part of it. So we wanted to conduct an experiment of sorts to see how we can recreate or reproduce that knowledge through the lens of young um, artists. And the Swedish Museum is one of our partners, the Ethnographic Museums, and they have 1,200 Zambian objects of different kinds, um, from household objects to ritual objects to documents. And these were all collected, you know. I mean, the first time I went there, because I went to do some work in Sweden, and one of my friends was like, oh, you should go to the Ethnographic Museum. The African curator there is, is really good. And when I arrived there, he said, oh, you're from Zambia. I should show you some artifacts from Zambia. And in my head, I was like, why do you have artifacts from Zambia? Because Sweden is not known as a colonial master of any kind in its history. But it turns out that they would book space, rent space on voyages, uh, by the British to come to Africa as well and also participated in this looting experience. So that was interesting. And the first object I encountered was a Makishi mask, um, which I've since seen in so many institutions across Europe and, and, and the US. And the Makishi mask was in a form that was so deactivated. And I'm from the place where the Makishi comes from. It's a Lubale artifact that is used as a knowledge transmission object for ancestors to uh, come during a ritual of young boys 
called Muganda, where they make contact with the ancestors and the ancestors um, transmit knowledge for them to become responsible men in society. So that whole ritual has now more or less been so distorted because religion, colonialism, and the lack of having those objects no longer allows the communities to practice um, the, the ritual and ceremony in the way that it should. And it was interesting to me to watch this object because I've seen the full Mukanda ceremony be so inanimate and deactivated in its display without the correct attribution to what this important object is and not really producing any kind of knowledge uh, in, it, in, it, in its form, the way it was in, in the museum. And this started for us a process where we now worked with the museum to then get the objects and in a virtual way and onto a virtual platform and allow them to return to their communities um, so that we can activate them in a way that's responsible, in a way that provides social justice, and in a way that allows us to reproduce the knowledge that should be reproduced uh, by those objects. So Fabricated Stories was an initial uh, idea around that practice. And, and it is something that we're now continuing with the digital platform. We have also visited communities and knowledge keepers and shown them some of these objects. And it's interesting to see the visceral reaction um, of the community leaders, especially the older ones who would remember these objects and remember that their grand uh, father or grandmother used to make them or this this is what it was used for and now we no longer do that and to see the sense of validation they feel that you know their objects do matter um, and they can contribute to a knowledge system in society that can impact uh, lives. I've certainly been impacted by my own indigenous knowledge, whether it's directly or indirectly. I only recognize it now because it's something that's embodied in us. And that's something else that we totally miss in terms of understanding the language of indigenous knowledge or um, indigenous practices, because when we learn in a modern system, we learn in a classroom or by writing. But there are different forms of learning. Robin, you mentioned dancing. Dancing was a huge part of it, ritual. Uh, we have our own language, particularly for the Luwale, but I know other uh, tribes as well. It's called Tusona, and these are symbols which were embedded onto our bodies and em embedded onto artifacts. So somebody that is outside this um, culture would look at it and think, oh, that's a pretty piece of, you know, art and drawing, but it's actually a language that is being used to transmit certain knowledge. And uh, I have a huge problem with the word scarification because that is what is used to describe markings on the body. But for us, it's not scarification. It's actually a language embedded in our bodies. And we learn with our bodies because you won't forget the, the, the language, you won't forget the process. And that was part of the process of the school of ritual because you're using your body to learn a process, to, to transmit a knowledge. Mwamba described what is essentially a school of ritual where she went through this process of understanding and learning what she needs to do in, in a marriage, equip her with tools. And she did, she, obviously we don't have time to go further in that, but she would then elaborate and share with you that there are certain uh, teachings that she went to physically that she had to do in order for her to go through this school and be able to get to the end and come out a different person, essentially. A person equipped with this knowledge to handle uh, being uh, in a marriage. And some of that as well is completely erased and no longer uh, practiced. So these are some of the things that we uh, we endeavor to do with the work that we're doing, restoring these institutions of knowledge, validating them, legitimizing them, and working with institutions in the West to correct some of these asymmetries that have been um, created. I think I'll stop there. That's such brilliant work, I'm blown away. What you've taught us today about your culture. And you founded the Women's History Museum in 2017. Why was there a need for such a museum? Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, there's a we have an ongoing debate about. I, I'm not even sure we're supposed to be called a museum, to be honest, um, because museums are um, inheritance, a hangover from the col uh, colonial age, 
you know, uh, and museums in effect were cabinets of curiosity where they would collect objects, put them in a thing and then decide what the meaning is. And in, in, in Zambia in particular, we haven't moved that far along. If you look at the state museums, we haven't moved that far along from what a colonial museum is. If you walk into our museums now, you still see very much the same kind of re reproduction of ideas of what culture and heritage is or what knowledge is or what uh, our communities are. And uh, it's painful to see. And that's some of the things that we are counteracting. So we felt that there was a gap in in the sector and uh, the our responsibility is to kind of poke holes at the status quo and insist that there some should be some kind of movement and change around the museum sectors in Zambia but in Africa in general because it's similar I think across the region Great, thank you for that. Time is really running quickly. So we're gonna jump over to Nana Ofori Atta Ayim. Hello, and thank you for joining us. You're glowing on camera today. So in 2002, you founded the Anna Institute of Arts and Knowledge. What led you to create this institute? Um, hi, this is incredible, um, just listening to everybody and um, being inspired and also um, having the space because so much of, I feel like the spaces that we trans traverse are violent spaces. So it's really quite incredible to be within this space and to listen. Um, so the question was what led me to set it up? Was that what you said? Yeah. Um, I, I think there were two kind of main impetuses. One was that um, whenever I went home, I was studying in London at the time, whenever I went home, the way that art was presented was as part of life, it wasn't separate. Um, and whenever I, where I saw at the time, whenever I saw African art represented, it was in these glass cases, very disembodied, et cetera. And I just, there was too much of a gap. And so I wanted to close that gap. And also at the time, I really wanted, you know, it was still the time when African art was still described as primitive, fetish, all of these words were still in currency. And I just wanted to bring our value system into a kind of relativity, into a center rather than in at the margins. I've shifted quite a lot from that desire of wanting to be in the center because I feel like um, not so much a desire or a put as, you know, you know, all these years later, we actually succeeded. I did um, in 2019 Ghana's first pavilion at the Venice Biennale, which was the center of the centers. And that experience really, whew, it was a very awakening experience being in the kind of center of the art world and us being in the center of, you know, like next to Germany and England. And this is this had been kind of what I'd been working towards was Ghanaian art and cultural expression being valued on the same level. And once there realized that this was actually not the destination at all. Um, Robin was talking about this idea of mimicking Western structures. And what I realized was that in the kind of self-assertion, what was happening was that violence of mimicking, you know, of capitalist structures, of um, exploitative structures, um, you know, of the commercialization and packaging and, you know, suddenly Ghanaian art was everywhere and was attractive and everything. But the very core of what I'd been trying to connect with and unearth was completely getting lost in that. And so we it took quite a sharp pivot with Anno. Anno comes from the word Enno in um, Chui, which means grandmother. And the reason I called um, the organization Enno was because um, whenever I went home to my hometown, um, I come from the rainforest area in Ghana, all of the cultural knowledge that I would get would be from grandmothers. We'd sit outside, my mom had like a porch outside her house and I'd sit there and the old ladies would sit there and they would be, you know, telling, throwing proverbs and explaining to me this. And, and so much knowledge came to me from grandmothers. And I and I kind of wanted to upturn this idea of knowledge as being, um, you know, encapsulated by old white men, which is the idea of knowledge that we've been passed on from the Western canon to this idea of this kind of 
knowledge that flows um, like a river in a way from these grandmothers. And so to reconnect with that initial impetus, I kind of pivoted because I realized that um, in moving within the parameters of the art world, um, there was only more perpetuation of the same to be had. And so we we're kind of in this process now of shifting. Um, we have, you know, we've had things like a cultural leadership fellowship, et cetera, but we're now starting, we're going all the way back and 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 moving from being an arts and cultural organization primarily to going into education and research. Because um, first of all, in the work that I've been doing with knowledge keepers um, over the last decade or so, realizing that we have so many intact knowledge systems um, that, you know, like my fear when I started this work was that so much had been lost. Um, and I very quickly, or not that quickly, but realized in the work that I was doing that actually so much has been preserved, but it's not in the forms that I knew to look in or look at. And, and so when Samba talks about these institutions of knowledge, I really love that because you know, I remember one of the knowledge keepers saying like an adinkra symbol is a space that you can enter. It's a realm. And I was just like, you know, there's just different layers of knowledge and of of, of preserving, of keeping knowledge that are so um, alien to the way that we've been taught them within the Western educational system. Um, and so what we're now working on is how do we first of all, codify that knowledge in a way that respects it and respects its sacredness. So not just kind of taking it and being like, um, oh, this, you know, this is what we want to do, doing it in a very, very careful and respectful way with the guidance um, of knowledge keepers. And then creating structures where from a very young age, we can reconnect with that because these knowledge systems were passed on from childhood. And so, you know, we've started with a farm, a permaculture farm, and it's not just in art was just one aspect of knowledge of nature, knowledge of the soul, you know, knowledge of the mind. And so integrating all of these things and trying to find ways of repassing them on. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. What have your experiences been of working with institutions like the VNA? and the pit rivers on repatriation oh, and pivot. can these be improved through the framework of rematriation um god okay um yeah um i mean it's kind of what i'm talking about in a way is um you know these spaces even kind of the most well meaning liberal western spaces in cap you know uh, can be spaces of violence even people who are wanting you know have good intentions um and so you know uh, yeah my experience is it, that's it's almost I feel like it's almost another <laughs> it's almost another conversation um you know Robin you mentioned as well the kind of paternalism that happens you know the VNA is giving some um, artifacts back for the 150th anniversary of the Ashanti looting. Um, but the terms with which they came back with were shocking, shocking. Um, yeah, th there's, there's stories and stories, but I think we're all familiar with them. And so in a way, this is such a um, positive and heartening um, conversation that I almost don't want to go into that heavy space of what happens in those encounters, because I feel like we all know about them. And, and you know, I, I think um, Robin mentioned that, that this was like m the beauty of rematriation, that it's pathways of possibility. Um, and I think that's what's beautiful about what everybody has said in this conversation is that it does open up these spaces of possibility within the kind of morass of heaviness and paternalism and, you know, that we have to deal with on a day to day basis. I hear you completely. Um, so in that case, let's um, just invite the audience to ask some questions. We've got a couple in the Q&A, but if you wanna keep them coming, we're gonna be coming to you very soon. In the meantime, I'm gonna go back to Robin. Um, perhaps you wish to speak to what Nana has just said, but I'd also like to ask 
about indigenous knowledge systems and their link, their deep link to their relationship with the earth and our natural environment. How does mm. this play a role in the context of restitution work? Mm. Yeah, well, I think um, what Nana was saying that um, about processes of uh, return, um, Sorry, there, you said so many really cool things. Both of you did. All of you did. I mean, I'm sort of just still processing. But from our perspective, from our um, society, like everything emanates from the land. You know what I mean? The land and the waterways. So like all of our knowledge system, our, our, our worldview, you know, our language actually comes from the land. Our origin stories say that we come from the land from which we have always been. And not necessarily over a Bering Strait, you know, a Bering Strait bridge, uh, an ice bridge in the ice age. And we came from Asia, you know, so there's all these ideas about who we are and where we come from. But we know, um, like Tsimtsian, um, the name we have for ourselves means people from within the Skeena River. So like we and we live on the Skeena River still. That's where our, our territory is. Um, all of our songs, you know, um, talk about our relationship to place, our prerogatives, you know, our rights, our responsibilities. Um, and uh, so when we're seeking the return of knowledge, ancestors or belonging. So like the the obvious is like when you're trying to re reclaim or or have ancestors rematriated this like the fact that our ancestors were literally dug up and disinterred and taken out of their sacred resting place um, in our territories um, and brought for study as specimens and uh, objects of curiosity in universities and laboratories worldwide um, getting th those ancestral remains back so that they can return to the land and be back in the land um, is a critical like philosophy for for balance and for livelihood for wellness um and so that's the obvious uh form of return and that connection between like a body and the landscape um but the objects themselves right what we think the belongings um come from our land like the sources the source materials that we use to create the things you know come right from our territory as well it, it's attached to a philosophy of um uh conservation and things like that of like how to make the most use out of the animals the, the lives that are given up for us to sustain ourselves um and and then you know, having those things returned, um, I'm picking up on what you, uh, Samba and Nana are talking about, you know, the the gaps in our knowledge systems, you know, are, we've been dislocated from place, they try to take us, dispossess us of, 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 of all of our belongings, all the sacred things that make us who we are, that ground us in our laws. Um, and sorry, I lost my train of thought, but you know, there is a gap in, in our contemporary knowledge system from all the effects of colonialism, right, on our people. And there is this idea that there's a deficit and people come come, come to it from a deficit perspective, right? Um, and I love what you said, uh, Samba, about how, you know, the, the issue of scarification, the way they described that situation. And, um, but rather how you say it's a it's it's a language in the school of ritual um, mm -hmm. that communicates knowledge and connects you to ancestors, right? So, and to place. And so, you know, it's so much more than just giving it some new name. Um, and so all of this reclamation work that we are trying to do and led by us, by women, time and time again in indigenous communities, um, is about reminding our people about that intimate relationship between our lands, our bodies, and our heritage, that they're all connected. Um, and so in the heritage discourse and the debates, we were the ones to problematize the binary between tangible and intangible heritage, um, or individual and collective property and things like that, because we don't see them as separate domains. They're actually all connected, right? Something that is tangible is always imbued with the intangible spirit of a thing and and vice versa. Um, so I don't know, actually, I, I'm kind of going off a little bit here, but I think, you know, that 
what's resonating with me from what's being said and in your question about the importance of land and knowledge, like it's all interconnected. Um, like even just with the uh, using Samba's metaphor about uh, the school of ritual and uh, it's in the, it's, it's a language we're communicating something, you know, um, in the body, um, our button blankets, we, we put our crest design on our button blankets when we dance. And similarly, all these people are like, Ooh, and eyeing at our beautiful button blankets and how nice they look when we dance together. And I'm saying those are actually legal documents, right? That crest design is telling the world, communicating to the world, what my rights are as a Simpsian woman in a Simpsian society in Simpsian territory. So it's all, all connected, but you have to have the literacy, the cultural literacy and integrity to be able to read that and even to understand it and respect it. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Robin Gray. And um, you you mentioned earlier about women leading the way um, when it comes to restitution. And that's what I love so much, much about this term rematriation or rematriation, I guess, depending on what side of the world you live on. Um, so if I can just put one more question out to you. Um, either maybe Mwamba or Samba, if you want to answer this one. During one of the conversations we had ahead of the event, we discussed how women in societies take on a leading role in processes of healing and repair. Mwamba or Samba, would you like to uh, give us a quick answer to this? And then we can move on to the audience. Mwamba, would you like to go? Or do you want? Well, it's fine. You can go ahead, Samba. Okay. I think in just the description, <laughs> in the description um, that we have given and the in what we've shared in our stories, what I came to to realize personally is, and that's why I mentioned the whole thing of living a duality, because I was I was actually living our indigenous um, way of life without realizing it. Uh, whereas in, in in the political Zambia, in my political context, you hear narratives of, oh, women are sidelined, they are incapable leaders, they need to be trained to be leaders. There's huge development movements in Zambia introduced by the West that whose goal and aim and objective is to come and teach um, Zambian women how to be leaders, um, how to be visible in, in community and societies. And yet um, there are so many ideas of what leadership is and what visible power is, uh, especially the whole idea of visible power. I, I recall this story where a group of um, a group of development workers went to a village north of Zambia, where Mwamba comes from, actually, and they found a group of men sitting in a what is called an insaka, essentially a meeting place, and they were having a meeting and discussing, and then they went to the women who were in a zango, which is another place, and they were gathered there, and they went there and they were like, you should, why are you here in this room being sidelined? You should go and sit there where the men are so that your voice can also be heard. So one of the elderly women looked at her and said, what, what makes you think our voice is not heard in that meeting? What makes you think we we are not part of that meeting? Well, you're because you're not there that yeah, we'll, we'll have you know that everything that is being discussed in that meeting, we are the ones who set the agenda. They're just executing it. <laughs> so the, it's really about this whole idea of visible and invisible power. In the West, visible power is you have to sit on a throne, you have to be seen, you have to wear this huge crown, and then you're the person who has that power. But in, in our indigenous societies, power is a different means a different thing uh, leadership means a different thing knowledge is a different thing or is executed in a different way and i think the women in our because we come from a matriarchal and matrilineal societies as well which means the importance is placed on the women uh, everything is deferred to the woman lineage is uh, heritage is deferred to the woman lineage is deferred to the woman so in that way it already gives agency um, to the woman, even rituals of healing, rituals 
of of uh, economy like when the men would go out and hunt and came back it was the women who gathered and uh, initiated all those things but these are things that we, we've been saying through this conversation have been separated from us and we've been dislocated from this knowledge and it's been de decontextualized such that now when we're trying to reintroduce them it's very confusing um, but women have been at the heart and and even though we don't recognize it, still operate very much at the center of knowledge production, particularly indigenous knowledge. Thank you for so much for that, Samba. We are now going to be moving on to questions from the participants. And we have a question from Sophie Starenberg. Please feel free, Sophie, if you'd like to, to come on camera or come on audio to ask your question. Thank you. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to uh, thank you to all the speakers for such an amazing uh, set of presentations. Um, this has just been really insightful, so thank you. Um, my question was specifically for Robin because you mentioned a lot about Indigenous laws. So my own background is in international law and I'd be just interested in hearing your thoughts on how we can do a better job of recentering Indigenous laws in the discussions that we have in restitution at the moment because I think the way that um, a lot of the debate is being held now as it's in the language of the laws of the settler state. It's in the language of international law, which has been established by those same states as well. And those legal frameworks don't acknowledge alternative forms of legal authority. So how would you see, practically speaking, what we could do to move the conversation forward to mm. recent indigenous ways of legal knowledge as well? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's the paradox of restitution discourse, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> that uh, we're trying to find solutions using the same laws that created the problems. <laughs> and so, so in a on a very basic level, so the argument that I continue to make is that you know indigenous laws must be respected and treated and activated as precedent for ownership, access, and control of indigenous cultural heritage. So that means not just indigenous law in a blanket slate, not in the way that the states uh, construct what indigenous law is. So we do a lot of that teaching here in Canada, right? Some students are wanna know what indigenous law is. So they go look at the way the state conceptualized law to govern and manage and deal with indigenous peoples and politics, but that's not indigenous law. Our indigenous laws emanate from from our relationship to place, right? And to um, ancestors and things like that. But, and they, we've used these laws to govern ourselves and diplomatic relations between other nations for thousands and thousands of years, hundreds of years in the more recent history of colonialism and imperialism, but still, um, so to use an example here in Canada, like we make, we've made many, many treaties, right? With your Western nations who come over and try to take over and, and settle and, and secure territoriality. Um, that goes to show that our laws predate the settler state, right? That they've had to be, they were beholden to our laws in the first place to even to ask permission with, from us. Things got lost in translation. Our laws became, they did all the things they needed to do to separate us from territory where the, the strength and the power of our laws exist and dislocate our communities which is the way that laws become lived and activated. Um, so, you know, when it concerns Zambian heritage, right, and dealing with the Sweden Museum, Sweden Museum needs to respect Zambian laws, ethics, and protocols about what restitution and repair and return should look like and feel like, and um, to set those, set those terms. And, you know, that's the only way I can see um, any change happening and and whether the state enacts and codifies new laws or not it's up to these institutions of the state um, to to shake things up and start doing things differently um, by taking the lead from the indigenous peoples whom are making uh, the claims and seeking the return um, for good reason so I think it's just, it has to happen at an ad hoc level, um, uh, case by case. But I think that institutions need to recognize and the gatekeepers at these institutions need to recognize 
their power, the power that they do hold to make decisions um, and to change things. And that's the only way museological praxis has even advanced. <laughs> yeah, it's because of pressure from indigenous peoples and communities on the ground, the 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 source communities of the heritage that they've captured and you know um, commoditized in their own spaces. You know, putting that pressure on. Uh, to get them to think differently and to even be open to something like return, right? So that's that's decades in the making just to get them open to return. I think we're at that critical turn now where we need to get you to, you know, institutions and gatekeepers to be open to the fact that their laws are inadequate to deal with something like restitution from our uh, perspective. Yeah. Thank you, Robin, and, and great question, Sophie. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to go on to Anthony Kaluma. He's got a couple of questions that he would like to put to the speakers. If you if you like to go on camera. Hello there. I like your background. Very lovely. <laughs> I, I, I've got two questions, but I was going to make them quite simple. I've, I've been on the Code of Ethics review this morning with the Museum Association, and we were talking about some of the ethics around the uh, collections. Now, when when you are talking about, uh, Robin, you're talking about uh, the fact that some of the laws are uh, from the patriarchal or the hegemony. I was looking at how we, with our indige indigenous knowledge, you know, how can we get this code of ethics that is governed by Okay, it's the museum association, but it, it is very sensitive in that some of these relics, you know, we've just seen an example of what Mamba said. I'm also looking at things in a way that some of the charms or some of the you know things that have been made specifically for somebody. Imagine going to a psychoanalysis and, and, and everybody knows exactly what they, they you've talked about. That's how I feel like. When, when I see some of these things being displayed, how can we sensitize these people so that they know that, especially curators, that these things should not be seen? So that, that, that's one question I was, I was really debating on how we can bring the rules around indigenous knowledge systems into the modern code of ethics. And the, the other one is that uh, I've realized that I come from a community where we have two women who are really known for their, they're like heroines for us. You know, we really revere them. One is a prophetess called Mepoho, and another one is the first woman, individual, not even woman, the first individual to rebel against the British imperialism, Meketalili. These two are well known in oral, and some people have written things about them, but I don't see any you know, anything coming up that more people don't know about them. So this, this is a kind of thing, we, we're talking about tangible heritage, but these, these are actually individuals. It's our heritage, but they're individuals, they're people. So these are two questions I was, I was looking at, the rules and the way we take things forward. Thank you. Um. Thank you for that, Anthony. Samba, do you want to speak to those points? Uh, thank you very much. I think it is, I mean, at the end of the day, one of the things as the Women's History Museum we realized is that um, even in the quest to ensure that indigenous knowledge can sit side by side with uh, modern knowledge systems, we have to create a structure around it. And I think part of it is it, uh, looking at the laws, looking at the code of ethics uh, and how that needs to be done. And the important part for us is, is giving agency to these communities to allow them to be a part of this conversation. Otherwise, it will be another repeat of where things are imposed. So understanding how laws were created and how, um, laws were instituted in the communities because they do exist, they are there, uh, but how do we translate and transmit that so that it can become 
um, it can become mainstream and it can become institutionalized even in uh, the political space that we exist in now. And that allows application because even now, uh, it was a great example that Robin gave, um, even though we have a great relationship with the Ethnographic Museum in Sweden and it's they, I've heard her horror stories about people who go into institutions and they're trying to have conversations about restitution and they face closed doors, but we've had an incredible relationship with our partners at the Ethnographic Museum. They've been very open, but the truth is they're also governed by laws. Um, and we don't have a system of governance under indigenous and cultural heritage on our side in the Zambian legal system that can support us going into these institutions and saying, this is a law that backs us up. This is what we wanna do. This is um, how it should go. And definitely those structures and systems need need to be built. And it's a huge part of the conversation that needs to be centered. Can I just add to, to that, to um, what Sam was saying? I think, Anthony, that um, it's about us doing it on our side and not, like, like for example, in Ghana, I've created this structure called a mobile museum, which is literally a museum that goes in and co-creates and co-curates with community members. And it's not a curatorial exercise in that I, I'm going in with a theme and um, you know exhibiting. It's really an act of learning as well. And in that process, learning as well about codes and ethics, et cetera. And so I think it's also about thinking outside of the box of the museum as we know it and creating other kinds of spaces that serve us. Um, you know, the mobile museum, for example, I've learned, we've, we have learned so much in the process and what's coming out of that are whole new ways of curating, of conservation, et cetera. Um, and then to what you were saying about the women and those stories, again, I think outside of the main stream educational museal networks, creating alternative, um, oh, at the beginning alternative um, in order for them to be experimental, but creating educational forms, methods, et cetera, which is also what we're trying to do right now in Ghana is create um, um, you know, um, curricula that are outside the mainstream curricula that we're then trying out that are based on indigenous knowledge that with the hope that at some point in the near future, they'll move into um, national curricula. So I think it's about starting. It's about, you know, not sitting back and saying, why is this not happening? But about actually taking the steps of doing it, however small and however tentative and however experimental they are. Yeah, it's true. And also, Anthony, we are run out of time. So I'm going to ask one more question, super, super quick question to Mwamba. Um, and this is from Sophia. How did the women in your community receive your artworks and how did it lead to conversations? Okay, the women, uh, how they reacted to my the work that I created? Yeah. Um, because uh, after the residence, we did have an exhibition, which were which was uh, in the Lusaka Museum, and we had a quite good number of people who came through. Even the ambassador of Sweden in Zambia was available. May, may her soul rest in peace. Uh, I quite had a lot of uh, questions from a lot of people uh, being, uh, a lot of people like, I didn't know that there are such objects which are based in the Sweden of museum. And a lot of people, they don't have that knowledge. And I, I quite have had a lot of questions uh, just based on that. I think we should, do more projects like these ones and just put the information out there because there are few people who know about this information or who knows that uh, we have about 1,200 objects uh, based in the Sweden Museum. Yeah. Thank Otherwise so the much. reaction was quite good from a lot of people. That's great to hear. Uh, well, we've come to the end. It's it's sad because these have been such incredible and insightful and enriching conversations. Um, if you'd like to watch or recap the series, they will be available on the Good to Institute London YouTube page. I will now invite Katerina von Rochester-Kata to close the series on behalf of Good to Institute London.
Hello, Katrina. Hello, Terry, and thank you so much for giving me the uh, one minute to close this, and thank you all so much, you for the wonderful moderation and the panelists for this super interesting uh, talk, and of course, Sophia Lovegrove for the uh, amazing curatorship uh, of the whole series. It's really sad that this is the last one, and I also want to uh, grab the chance to to uh, to thank Estella and also Christine Christiane for the comms and also Francis for organizing everything. Maybe you can turn on all your cameras so we can see the, the people behind the scenes. So thank you so much. I we are all very um, you know ambitious in thinking how and yeah how we can actually. Uh, go on here, and uh, we are uh, committed to to continue the conversation. And it would be fantastic if we have your support. If you are still interested in that, and um, yeah, let us know if you want to somehow participate, um, collaborate, um, keep keep on posted. And uh, we are already in the discussion with the uh, looking at next year. Uh, doing something like a conference, like maybe a performance conference. So we're in conversation with the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin, the uh, House of the Cultures of the World. So it's everything is still moving, but we do hope that we will be able to, to get this conversation uh, going. There's so much still to discuss and so much still to connect uh, with. And so I'm, I hope you will all stay with us and uh, Meantime, wish you a wonderful time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katerina. So yeah, finally, we'd like to show our appreciation to the audience, our participants who enriched our conversations. We do hope you enjoyed the series and Good to Institute London will be sending a final mail out to participants with links to the YouTube videos of the series, an option to join the mailing list and links to our speakers if you'd like to connect with them on social media. So with that, we say thank you again. Hopefully we will see you again at future events. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.